pleasure to introduce uh, the moderator for the next panel. Um, this will be an interview of uh, the Register of Copyrights, the Honorable Maria Palente. For this session, we will be using uh, note cards uh, from the audience for you to ask and write down your questions ahead of time, and we will be sending the, uh, them up with about 15 minutes left in the session. So uh, there should be note cards going around, so please feel free to write down a question, and we will send them up to the moderator, and he probably won't be able to get to everybody's question, but um, at least uh, he'll have an opportunity to field some of the questions um, from the audience. Uh, our moderator for the interview is uh, Mr. Bart Lazar, who is a partner in the law firm of Seaforth and Shaw. Uh, he earned his uh, degree from University of Chicago, uh, and then his JD from uh, here at Chicago Kent, and he also uh, received an LLM in trade regulation from NYU School of Law. Uh, he practices in various areas, uh, including intellectual property, privacy, advertising, and other related matters. Uh, Bart? Uh, thank you, Ed. And um, and uh, I'd like to welcome uh, Maria Palante. I'm, uh, thank you so much for uh, coming here this afternoon. And we're now, yes, it's, we're moving from uh, patents to copyright. Uh, Ms. Palante is really uniquely qualified uh, to be a Register of Copyrights with a wide variety of experience in the field. Um, and she is the 12th Register of Copyrights and has been uh, Register of Copyrights uh, first as an interim uh, or acting register uh, in uh, early two, for, for five months, and then uh, has been the register since June 1st, 2011. Um, in terms of her experience, her academic background, she is a 1990 graduate of the George Washington University Law School, and she also previously earned a bachelor's degree in history from Misericordia University, where she was also awarded an honorary doctorate of humane letters. Um, in her law and copyright practice. She has represented virtually every type of stakeholder there could be, I think, in the copyright field. Uh, first serving, acting as a member of a law firm and literary agency. Uh, she has also worked uh, on, with uh, collectives uh, uh, representing uh, authors, uh, so the National Wri uh, Writers Union and the Authors Guild. So there's representing a group of copyright owners. Uh, she's also served inside as counsel to uh, the Guggenheim Museums for eight years. So there you have uh, working for representing a large uh, copyright owner, would you say? Absolutely. Okay. And uh, finally, uh, with uh, the several years both working um, before re being registered for copyright, uh, working on the inside at the Copyright Office in a number of different positions. So thank you very much uh, for coming today. Bert, my pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the law school for inviting me. It's great to be in Chicago. I am a Cubs fan, uh, and I, I was saying this is my first trip as Register of Copyrights to Chicago, but um, by no means my last, and uh, I did, did spend some time here earlier in my career because both the Authors Guild and the Writers Union have very significant chapters of book authors and journalists here. This is Chicago, and uh, with the Art Institute, um, I've had a close relationship since my days at the Guggenheim. Um, and in our, um, the, we're here today to talk a bit about issues that are facing the Copyright Office uh, this year. And in your materials, there's a 16-page uh, description of the priorities and special projects of the United States Copyright Office um, from 2011. And uh, I won't ask you to summarize all that <laughs> 16 pages in one statement, but uh, I think to start with the question, um, in that document, and you've been the register for, for a couple of years now, you announced a number of initiatives and priorities for the Copyright Office. Can you give us an idea of uh, what your, the current priorities are and uh, how successful have you been in implementing some of them? Well, thank you for the question. I'm happy to answer it, I think. Uh, and thanks for handing out the document itself. Uh, I have a copy that's here. A, that, that's, it's it, public domain work, isn't it? It, it, it was a work for hire, <laughs> it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's on our website, and we will be, uh, it was published last October, so I became registered on June 1st, and uh, immediately spent the summer working organically with the staff. We have about 500 people on the staff. Uh, to really kind of air out the office a bit, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of pressure when your predecessor has been in the position for 16 years. Uh, on the one hand, you don't want to move any deck chairs too soon. On the other hand, there are a lot of people that were kind of you know, coming uh, with a lot of good ideas and um, 
you know, one thing about the uh, Library of Congress where we're housed is that people stay for a long time. So um, I had uh, immediate recognition that we had a lot of young people coming in very interested, for example, in the intersection of copyright and technology. Uh, but looking ahead and kind of seeing that, you know, most of the managers had been there for decades, so I, I knew I had a staffing issue that I needed to reconcile to kind of attract good people. So for all of those reasons, I um, decided I wouldn't sit down and write a strategic plan for the office. Um, I had been there for four years. I had mostly worked on policy in the, in the international realm, uh, the World Intellectual Property Organization and uh, on some domestic initiatives like Orphan Works. Hadn't really spent much time on the operations of the office. Uh, most of the people, as you can imagine, work in the registration system. And so uh, decided it would be much better to have a kind of participatory process with both internal stakeholders and external so I could really get a handle on what people wanted the office to do and whether we could actually meet the expectations, right? I mean, we can... We, we can dream big, and I always tell the staff, when you're putting together uh, the projects for the future, take money off the table, uh, which sounds like a ludicrous you know, uh, directive in the federal government these days. Like, don't let money be a problem. Uh, of course, it's the biggest problem, but uh, I knew that that would immediately um, kill the idealism. So with all of that as kind of the backdrop, um, we needed to kind of also do an exercise, I think, in transparency. What would the tenure be about? Uh, and uh, as is clear from the document, if you've read it, half of the job of being the Register of Copyrights is law and policy at a very technical level, and the other half is really being a CEO. So, you know, there were people coming to me that, you know, for, like from the unions and uh, from HR and from um, all kinds of offices I had never interacted with. And, I needed to kind of figure out if we had a staffing uh, org chart that was dated. The answer is yes. Uh, did we ha were we putting resources in the right places? Did we need more attorneys? All of that. So to uh, cut to the chase, I think that uh, on the operations side, we created 10 special projects, some of which are a way to allow us to be entrepreneurial and partner with the private sector and academic institutions so that we can't, you know, we can't do everything ourselves, but some of which will really inform the office for the 21st century. So for example, um, registration is now electronic and there was a lot of interest from Congress about backlog, just like with the PTO. Uh, how long does it take to get a registration? Well, we've got the backlog under control. It really takes between three and five months to get a registration. Some are much quicker. But that to me was not really the right question. The right question was what is the value of a copyright registration in 2012? Who uses it? Why do people register? Is it really only because of statutory damages? And the answer to those questions is that is a big reason, but it's not by any means the only reason. A lot of people use it for licensing as you know, evidence of title. Uh, a lot of foreign courts look at it uh, when they're settling, but not for the application of statutory damages. So the other big, big department at the library uh, uh, in, that interacts with the library, I should say, uh, is recordation. So we have many statutory functions in Title 17. One is registration, and the other big one is recordation of transfers and assignments of copyright. So that is, I think, a stepchild in the organization, but yet at the same time, I think uh, if you have any vision at all, you can see that that kind of database of copyright ownership is really, really important, and the government can play a really important role. It's a very kind of trusted government undertaking to have a database of that kind of information and to make it accessible. So those are the operations uh, priorities. On the policy side, uh, again, as you all know, online piracy uh, is, is a priority of Congress, therefore it's a priority for me. Orphan works, updates for libraries, um, reviewing the DMCA and the application in, in 2012, all of those things kind of fit together as uh, the areas of Title 17 that deserve some second looks. Well, that answers your of, question. Yeah, there's a lot of <laughs> questions to follow up from there. Um, I think one of the things I uh, took from, uh, you know, what is the meaning of a, of a registration today? How do you, and maybe how do you make a registration more meaningful to, a, to an owner? As a practitioner, yes, I talk about statutory damages, the availability of statutory damages if you do register your copyright and attorney's fees, um, but it's important on these other sh issues. I, I guess one, one thing I was thinking about is, 
right now registration registrants only pay a fee when they apply for a copyright registration. And unlike in the patent scheme and in the trademark scheme, where you do have to pay uh, mo money to keep your IP rights going, um, in some respect, is there any thought to um, going to that kind of model with the copyright office? Um. So you, you would like a model that gives me more money? I sure. like that. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. It, well, maybe it may give you more money. I like on that. Our no. yeah. <laughs> uh, that's, so that's a really complex legal question, and it, it comes up every now and then. It's really kind of a maintenance fee, uh, and why, why can't we have something like that? So you know, speaking as technical copyright experts in this room, we could do something like that for, for US copyright owners. We can't really do it for foreign copyright owners. We'd immediately run into problems with burn uh, and trips to the extent it incorporates burn. And I guess um, just from a policy perspective, uh, the trend today is to, to engage in international agreements. So whether it's trade or whether it's uh, new treaties, like the audiovisual treaty that was just concluded in Beijing, the trend is to do things that can be applied to most countries who are members of Burn or TRIPS, not to do things that are really only possible in your own country. So to play that out, if we were to go down that road, we would, ha we would do something like that. We would hope other countries would do something like that. And then maybe decades from now, there would be some harmonization effort to make something like that happen. So I think what you're really asking me is kind of a US leadership question. You know, should we do something like that? So let's just put that over here for a moment. Then the question is, what do I think of that as a policy perspective? Um, I think that we could do something that makes copyright owners more likely to make their themselves known and to incentivize that. So we're not going to take rights away from copyright owners, but we could incentivize them by saying, you get uh, certain kinds of remedies if you every 10 years, 15 years, 30 years, or when the author dies, come forward and, and make yourselves available. Big question is, do they have to do that in the copyright office, or do they do that in some other way? And that comes back to kind of the technical issues we were discussing a moment ago. Um, should the office be the only depository or repository for that kind of information, or should I, as the register, really be thinking about how we connect to private databases? So ASCAP has a database, Sound Exchange has a database, BMI has a database, the authors have a database, uh, the uh, CCC in uh, Boston has a database for, for publishers. We don't want to stop that because um, I don't know what all of you think of when I say the phrase government IT, but it should be obvious that we're, you know, we're not nimble when it comes to implementing kind of savvy technological tools. And I think, uh, I don't want to say it's our job to kind of put information out in a way that's good enough, but it is our job to incentivize that kind of information, and it is our job to put some database together that others can then take and improve upon. So without answering the question directly, I think uh, it's a useful thing to discuss. Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. on the technology, te technology standpoint, it's certainly the useful to have a centralized database for images or uh, it, I know that's almost in maybe that's an impossible dream but but that's uh, people involved in in graphic design and using photography wanting to try to find out who they should who they should contact which I guess is really sort of the or, partially the orphan works issue um, and just to, if you're not familiar the term orphan works I think can, can have multiple yeah. definitions yeah. Um, but I'm going to use your, try to use your definition from your, your document. Um, but an orphan work is um, a work where an author cannot be identified and located by prospective users in situations that would otherwise require permissions and licenses. So if I were looking to put a photograph within my, um, within a book, a uh, commercial book, and I could not find um, who was the owner. So I'm sort of stuck, aren't I? And do I use that photo? And then someone comes out of the woodwork and oh, this was registered as part of my collective work, you know, 10 years ago, and I get to go after you for statutory damages, or, or do I just not use that work? Um, and um, I believe in, this sort of meets with, with, with your international uh, relations comment too, that other countries, like Canada, the EU, um, they've been, seem to be a, a little bit ahead of us in, in sort of dealing, okay, um, uh, dealing with the, uh, 
uh, orphan work legislation. Mm -hmm. um, maybe we're not. Maybe tell. Maybe correct. Correct me. Well, it, uh, and what are we doing? What are we? What are, what are we I'm, thinking about doing? Of what course, doing? the EU is yeah. not ahead of us when it comes to copyright. Um, <laughs> <laughs> The, uh, so the orphan works issue hits a lot of policy questions. Uh, some have to do with the, again, what information the office can collect in a voluntary registration system and how it can kind of uh, make it searchable in a useful way that would further commerce. And you have to assume that the situation we're talking about is not one where fair use applies, um, but it is one where a good faith owner and a good faith user uh, are in the mix. So the the user is technically in the orphans regime that Congress looked at a couple of years ago, technically an infringer, but we, you know it introduced kind of this new vernacular of a very good faith infringer that we wanted to protect as much as we wanted to protect the original copyright owner. And so that would have taken statutory damages off the table. It's again kind of an approach that would, would have introduced some safety valves into copyright or maybe let the air out of the tires a little bit, the pressure. By, take, by, by looking at the remedy and, and playing with the remedy that would be available. So I don't, you know, a couple of things happened. The big thing that happened was the Google Book Settlement uh, was introduced and because it had a different definition of orphan works and would have affected the orphan works discussion and did, uh, the legislative process was put on hold. Not indefinitely, we'll be looking at that. I, my prediction is we'll be looking at Orphan Works a lot with the new Congress coming in. And we're working very actively in the office to kind of pick up where we were, which was a one-by-one on, a one one approach. So you want to use a, a photograph in a documentary film. What steps do you have to take to be able to use that photograph? On top of that is kind of the Google mass digitization library issue that was introduced, which is not a one-by-one one problem, but um, we're scanning hundreds and hundreds of I images, books, whatever it is. It's not necessarily true that we wouldn't find some of the owners. It's just not cost-effective to go through that process. So um, those aren't really orphan works. Uh, I don't think any copyright lawyer with a, you know, can say with a straight face that those are orphans. But it's a, it's a different kind of issue. It's a cost-effective issue. Is it, what do you do to kind of, at, how do you deal with the rights since there's no one place to go? And because if you're talking about a book, you may have images, you may have essays by different authors, and uh, even all of the best copyright lawyers in a room wouldn't be able to find every, every uh, copyright owner of every exclusive right that's implicated, so how can you expect the general public to do that? Sure. Right, so lots of problems and issues there that we needed to work through. Um, I don't know if you have any other questions about orphans in particular, but the EU took photographs out of the mix, mm -hmm. and uh, they they really uh, they took our approach, which was a good faith uh, search is required as a threshold matter, and you know this is an approach that we talk about internationally, so we're happy that they did that, um, and then uh, certain kinds of uses were permissible after the fact, but if the owner shows up, there's a series of things that then then happen. Um, interestingly, the Google Book case focused Orphan Works and the discussion on books. But empirically, and you can look at the original 2006 Orphan Works report, books were never the issue. It was always images. So, you know, we're, we're kind of at a crossroads with this issue. We probably could craft legislation that dealt with Orphan Works in a much smaller way than was originally envisioned. But I guess from a policy perspective and as a policy lawyer, I'm not sure it makes a lot of sense uh, to not address photographs or visual art at all if we know that that is where the most of the stress is coming from. So, uh, you know, some things that we could look at are pilot projects with the blessing of Congress. Um, part of the problem for photographers in particular is that they don't have, first of all, they're fragmented, so there are many of them, many little groups, and some uh, more vocal than others, but nobody really just speaks for all photographers. It's kind of you know, a general issue for individual authors. Uh, but one of the one of the questions is, uh, you know, if they don't have the resources to kind of create the database everybody wants and wants us to do it, what are the expectations and the role of government? So we're kind of back to that kind of resource question. It's true that when um, we were working on Orphan Works a couple of years ago, a lot of people said, you should just take all the deposits that come in with copyright registrations and make them searchable. 
and people will develop the image recognition software to make that possible. And we had all kinds of really cool technology firms coming in, uh, like PicScout, which used to work with the Israeli army, for example, and had all this very useful technology that would have worked. But the problem is, when you register, I don't know if anybody's a photographer in this room. Well, I saw a photographer here earlier. When, when you register your photography with us, your expectation is not that we're going to take your photograph and publish it as the government and aid in you know, contributory infringement. Uh, that, on the contrary, you expect us to keep it safe and to put the ownership information out there. So then we got, kind of got through that discussion and, and then you know, the discussion changed to, well, okay, what you need is a database where people can upload the image and then that would of course have to be fair use because you're uploading you're making a copy so that people can find the owner. And then you would have some kind of you know, Star Wars program behind closed doors where you would just spit out uh, the match. And you know, the, I just don't think we're going to get there, technologically speaking, as the US government. But that's the kind of thing that, you know, here's the policy question. Do you wait for that kind of uh, searching to happen before you enact orphan works legislation. And that was really kind of where we left it in 2008. Um, you know, how do, we, how do we solve that technical piece before we, we change the law? And as a result, you know, what, what has happened now, and if you're following the Google book case, you know this, the US government brief basically said, look, these are huge questions, orphan works, collective licensing, registries, we greatly need all of these developments but you can't do this for one party, Google. You need to let Congress do this. These are policy decisions. Don't legislate compulsory licenses and other things from the bench. And Judge Chin said exactly that. These are all really interesting questions. I think the registry idea is critical. I think opt-out could work in the future if Congress changed the law, but it's not the law today. So I'm handing it back to Congress and now, uh, we're, we're, as we've been telling Congress, it's all yours. Let's do it. <laughs> right, and one thing in the history of, of uh, copyright law, um, we've never waited for technology uh, to change the law. <laughs> I mean, right. Technology has always, since its beginning, outpaced uh, copyright law. Uh, and given that, in, since the last major overhaul really was 1976, although the DMCA was a substantial, uh, substantial change with regard to many, many uses and safe harbors, is it, uh, and, and maybe orphans is part of the whole, another part of a big project that is, is a big enough project to handle by itself. Was it, is that, should that be part of a entire revision or a significant revision of the Copyright Act? Well, um, that's an outstanding question. And what I will say is that no one in Congress has signaled, no one from the judiciary committees that have in the House or Senate, which have jurisdiction over copyright law, have signaled that they want a massive overhaul of the Copyright Act. I think the concern is that in the past, when they were doing updates uh, all, all the way back, they were really uh, updates improving uh, the protection for authors and making sure that new exceptions and limitations uh, were in place. I think today the concern is that that's not what people mean when they talk about copyright reform. They, they are talking about an entirely different um, construct altogether where copyright law would uh, be diminished. And I think that is why no one uses the big R word, reform. That said, um, there's no question that Title 17 is outdated, uh, even just the, the provisions we use on a daily basis. And it's outdated in many, many ways. I think the DMCA was innovative le legislation in 1998. Uh, it was innovative legislation for a nascent industry. Um, Google, I think, was went public a month before the DMCA. So uh, many of the uh, organizations that consistently file briefs uh, about the public domain or about exceptions and limitations didn't exist uh, back then. So we're definitely in a new place. I just uh, I think that today we've got you know what what is happening from a policy perspective is that the inherent constitutional balance which is between protection of authors' exclusive rights and public access, that weighing, which is so critical to the role of Congress, has shifted a bit out of just de facto stress to being a balancing act between a very healthy tech sector on the one hand and a very healthy content industry on the other hand. 
And that is not the right balance. That, I'm not saying that Congress doesn't need to balance the political interest of giants. It certainly has to do that as a practical matter. But uh, it has to really look at uh, authors' rights, and this is kind of my, you know, my big concern as the register, uh, what's invisible in the mix today. The, the exclusive rights of individual authors and those who invest in them is the core public interest concern. That's at the heart of the public interest equation. It's not antithetical to it. It's not that um, you know that stuff is collateral damage. That if you know books and movies and films you know are used without permission, it's all for the greater good. That is part of the greater good. And trying to kind of get people back to that is a big goal of the office. Sure. And mm -hmm. actually, part of that, the policies that you're talking about, I think it, it, it it's a. Uh, it's a little bit similar to the conversation we were having in the prior panel. Yeah. Where we were talking in the patent area about, uh, I mean, in, in, at least in copyright law, we have fair use, and it's, uh, I wouldn't throw that out. I mean, it's a, it's a test, it's, it, it's their yeah. guidepost, and we have a, many years of in, judicial interpretations, but we find that the patent law doesn't necessarily have the same uh, principle involved where they're, to, to balance that way, even though they come from the same um, uh, mandate. Uh, and one of our questions from the audience is, given the overlap of IP rights, such as patents, trademarks, and copyrights, for some items like software or useful articles, mm -hmm. um, should the Copyright Office coordinate policy more with the USPTO? Or maybe the reverse, should it be that the PTO is more coordinating policy with you? Um, I'm not entirely sure I understood the question, but uh, we, do, we do actually coordinate with the PTO on almost everything we do. So. Uh, the head of the Patent and Trademark Office, Dave Kapos, is probably one of my most important colleagues in Washington. Um, Victoria Espinel, who's the Intellectual Property Enforcement Coordinator for the White House, is another one uh, in the administration that we work very closely with and are required to do by statute. But uh, I, you know, most of the, t the big dynamic with copyright is are you looking to international trends to change US law or are you trying to, um, sell US law to the rest of the world. And that's an old dynamic, and it, you know, it came up in Golan because I think some, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but you know, the question is really, uh, is trade ruining US law? Some people think that, but the reality is the US, and especially the undersecretary and USTR, have to engage with foreign countries on agreements that uh, make copyright and IP in general work in the marketplace around the world. It's a global marketplace, so you can't just kind of say we need to be isolationist on that. That's a big factor in policy. But I think um, if the question was about registration, the Patent and Trademark Office registers patents and trademarks. We register copyrights. Why do we do that? We register copyrights because copyright in general is a much more cultural law, and for you know that's where Congress saw fit to put the Copyright Office. There's a close connection to the Library of Congress as a cultural institution, and the Librarian of Congress, as you probably know, uh, oversees not just, uh, you know, very loosely oversees not just the Copyright Office, but the Copyright Royalty Board judges uh, and the Congressional Research Service and other things that, you know, come into play with policy. So I, um, you know, I think if you're a compulsive person, and you wanted to fix the federal government, you could bang your head against a wall for a long time, saying, you know, why, why don't we just consolidate all the things that are kind of like each other? But um, I actually, maybe because I've been in the system now for a little while, I, I think it works fine. I think there's a nice check and balance. I think there's a lot of respect about the roles of each of the agencies. And, you know, as I described earlier, I think, you know, for USTR, uh, their mission is trade. They do a really good job of, of trying to fulfill their statutory responsibilities. There's some conflict if you're looking at it from a cultural perspective. There's some conflict if you're a State Department and you're, you, know, you, don't, you don't wanna be on China's case right now because you've got something else in the works that's really important diplomatically. But that, I think that's what the federal government's supposed to do. So I think we're fine. You know, it works pretty well at the staff level. Um, one of the things that you were mentioning is one of your priorities and, uh, and the, the, the uh, the office priorities is dealing with, uh, you know, pri piracy, and uh, we still have a lot of issues. Uh, the MCA was pr protects uh, ISPs, but we still have a lot of situations where, uh, as I think you said in your statement to Congress last year, 
There are operators of rogue websites. They exploit copyrighted works with impunity because there's no expectation of enforcement and they have no fear of being brought to justice. Um, what role do you believe others in, let's say, the internet ecosystem? How, how, can, or how can the U.S. act uh, independently, coordinated with other countries to try to combat rogue websites uh, operating outside of the United States? Right. Um, so <laughs> that's like an so enor can, enormous you know, that, that question. That could be a day-long <laughs> seminar in, in and of itself. It's not but that five hard. Minutes, uh, it, so that, that's, a, that's the $10 million question. And uh, obviously, we don't know the answer yet. But th what we do know is kind of what's been happening to date. So what's been happening to date um, is that under civil forfeiture laws that are already in place, uh, or uh, law enforcement entities like ICE or Custom Border um, Protection, uh, you know, with, with the blessing of the IPAC and DOJ, have been uh, conducting what they call operation in our sites where they target criminal infringement, uh, but not just copyright. Sometimes there's unsafe medicine being sold through a website. Sometimes there are you know, gambling rings or other kinds of things at play with these organizations. Sometimes copyright's the front, right? I'm selling movies, but I'm really selling drugs. So I'm not, you know, I don't work in law enforcement. I don't have a gun, I don't have a badge, I don't have anything cool like that. But we, we've worked with them enough to know that when they target these sites and they uh, take them down, they try to take the domain name down um, for the infringement, yes, but also as a consumer protection action. So in many ways, what ICE was trying to do with operation in our sites was to make uh, .com, .org, and .net safe. They, you know, they can't police every domain name, but they were trying to make those relatively predictable for consumers. So then the question became, well, to the extent that you can't get at the owner of the domain name or the website, the ISP, because they are based offshore, as you, as you set up the question, what do you do there? Well, you could work with a foreign country uh, to go and say, we've identified this actor because you deal with him or them. Um, and, and that, for a lot of people, is the right solution. Or you could try to craft something innovative where the attorney general in particular would have 21st century tools to go after 21st century criminals. Now, this is where it gets complicated because the more tools you have, the more due process you need. And, you know, talking about the First Amendment, just to kind of loop back to what you were saying, Bert, I think um, the fear with allowing the attorney general uh, or law enforcement to block website access in the US, so they can't shut down the operators, but they can block for US consumers the website and its impact here. So if you're, you're typing in Ugg boots uh, and they've, you know, it fills in Ugg boots from, you know, stolen Ugg boots or Ugg boots for free, uh, you would never get that here. So what's the fear with that? Well, a couple of fears. One is, you know, and this is how the Obama administration put it, do you trust government to do that? And of course the Obama administration says, well, we trust the Obama administration to do that properly. Um, for others, that's not a good enough answer. Uh, that could become an abuse in, in the system. How do you protect against that? Uh, what else? Well, um, what about innocent victims? Uh, what kind of notice is given? Now, if you were doing a raid on Canal Street in New York, you would just do the raid. You wouldn't give them a lot of prior notice or they would be gone. And that's, I think, where law enforcement was initially on this, that you know, what's the point of, of giving a lot of advance notice when we've got enough evidence and we can go into a court get an order, and get injunctions. So what would the injunctions do? They would tell payment processors to stop processing payments for these organizations. They would tell um, search engines to stop sending people to the websites. Uh, and they would tell ISPs that they have the cover that they need uh, to, to block you know, that website. And that, those are the kinds of things that were on the table during SOPA and PIPA. Well, I think that tool would be very mm -hmm. valuable in the trade in the Lanham Act, for example, uh, you can get ex parte seizures, uh, and and if you present uh, significant sufficient evidence of the, the unlawful activity, and that notice to the individual defendant would be fruitless. Right. Unfortunately, I mean the Copyright Act it's limited to impoundment and not seizure. So it's a question whether you impound doesn't impoundment probably doesn't go so maybe could go far to you know putting into trust uh, 
certain items, but it's, it certainly isn't as strong as the Lanham Act remedy, which has been, it, it has its faults too, but it's, it's, uh, it is a stronger remedy, I think, and it's more judicially, the judiciary is, as, as in my experience, is more understanding in a trademark context because it's laid out in the statute versus in, in a copyright where it's not as laid out. And if you ask a judge to follow the trademark procedures in a copyright case, they say, well, that's, you're talking about the, the wrong law here, counsel. Right. Um, would that, so, you think that might be, is that the kind of stuff you're talking about? Well, all, in general, you're just, you're, you're making the case that um, as, as infringement gets more sophisticated, the tools need to be responsive. It's just, um, unlike Canal Street, for example, when you're talking about websites, you're talking about content and expression, and that's why people kind of, you know, came out of the woodwork to complain. So that was an exercise of, you know, freedom of expression and speech, right? Just the whole Correct. legislative response from the general public. Um, the, you know, concern about the abuse of governments having those tools down the road, that's a concern. And then what is the right due process for any particular website and what kinds of uh, notice should they have uh, should it be prior or after the fact? And is it really that harmful if they uh, are taken down uh, innocently if they can be put back up you know, within a reasonable period of time? There are strong points of view on both sides of that, that, that issue. Um, criminal streaming comes to mind, if I can mention that. Um, so one of the things that got kind of left on the table was updating the Copyright Act when it comes to the public performance right which is, which is implicated when somebody streams a copyright at work. So this, this to me was, I, I think, unfortunate just because it was, of all of the things on the table, um, uh, where there were a lot of moving parts in SOPA and PIPA, this one I thought was relatively straightforward and it actually had its own, you know, we had a hearing just on it last June and uh, in, the, in the Senate it was actually a separate bill. But right now, um, uh, for willful copyright infringement, if you're implicating copies, so reproduction right or distribution right, uh, criminal penalties are available under the law. But if you're implicating the public performance right, they're not. And for me, this is a parity issue. Just if, as streaming has become uh, the, the tool of choice for many kinds of infringement, the, the penalties have to match. And there, there's, there is no incentive for the Department of Justice to go after uh, somebody who is in, who is infringing by streaming, if the most they're going to get is a misdemeanor. It's just a poor choice of resources. So uh, that's an example of Title 17. You know, it 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 plods along and it is updated as the evidence requires it. You know, makes a showing. And you know, I don't have to tell everybody in this room, especially the young people, but obviously. Streaming is a big deal now. It used to not be a problem because you weren't going to stream a movie because it would take forever and it wouldn't be that good. It wouldn't be that clear. Uh, but today, you know, it's quite possible that you'll have streaming activity, whether it's the Super Bowl and a live sporting event or whether it's a movie where there isn't a copy being made and therefore there isn't a way to get at that kind of activity when it's willful and egregious. We'll revisit all of this stuff to That's be continued. Right. Well, it's a myriad of issues that we were able to cover in a short period of time, but that gives you a snapshot. We could probably talk all day about the issues that uh, uh, Maria is facing as the Register of Copyrights, uh, but I want to thank you again for, for coming here, and My we'll pleasure. hear on the next panel. Okay.